Dear Father, we thank you that you sent your son, the Lord Jesus. We thank you that you sent him and he came to this earth. He lived this life and he died on the cross and he rose again. We thank you what that means to us, Lord, that we have, a sal- we have salvation. We have victory over sin. We have relationship with you. And so, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would fill me and strengthen me as I look at your word and speak your word, that it would come from you and not from me. And that, Lord, you would feed your people and strengthen them and use them for your good work. Thank you that you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Tony Compolo tells us a true story of a Jewish boy who suffered from Nazis in World War II. He was living in a small Polish village when he and all the other Jews of the vicinity were rounded up by the SS troops and sentenced to death. This boy joined his neighbors in digging a shallow ditch for their graves, then faced the firing squad with his parents. Sprayed with machine gun fire, bodies fell into the ditch, and the Nazis then covered the crumpled bodies with dirt. But none of the bullets hit the little boy. He was spattered with the blood of his parents, and when they fell in the ditch, he pretended to die and fall in the ditch with them. Well, the grave was so shallow that the thin covering of the dirt allowed the air to come in, and so he was able to breathe. And after several hours, he dug himself out. It had gone dark. It had become dark. He dug himself out. And with dirt and blood caked on his body, he made his way to the nearest home, and he begged for help. But when they answered the door and they saw that it was a Jewish boy, they were afraid. Afraid that the SS troops would come and get them if they helped him out. And so he went to another house and he knocked on the door. And the same thing. House after house as people feared getting into trouble with the SS troops. Well, then something inside him seemed to guide him to say something that would have been very strange for him to say. When he knocked on the next door and the door opened... They heard him say, don't you recognize me? I am the Jesus you say that you love. After a poignant pause, that woman who stood in the doorway swept him up off his feet and kissed him and hugged him. And he lived there and they treated him as his own. Who is this Christ that we talk about? And what do you expect of him? Who is the Lord Jesus that we proclaim and declare and worship and praise? And what do you expect of him? When you ask the question who, it is a matter of classification and order. It is a matter of category. If we can classify Jesus, if we can put him in a category, then we can respond to him. We know how to deal with him. Who is this Jesus? Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a Lutheran theologian, arrested by the Nazis as well and eventually killed, talked about a question of who he wrote this i have it on the screen here it says the question who expresses the strangeness and the otherness of the one encountered and at the same time it is shown to be the question concerning the very existence of the questioner he is talking about the being which is strange to his being about the boundaries of his own existence to ask god to ask christ who he is is to understand our own existence It is only from God that we know who we are. In the book of Mark, chapters 35 through 41, the Lord Jesus is asleep on the boat. (laughs) During a furious squall, he's asleep on the boat while the disciples are working overtime trying to keep the boat from tipping over. The storm is, is overwhelming and the waves are unrelenting. In frustration and defeat, the disciples, they get up and go over and wake up Jesus. In Mark, it says that the disciples went to Jesus and said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Their frustration has grown and they're now desperate. And they're wondering, well, maybe he can help at least. Pell some water, help row the boat, do something. He's just sleeping. So Jesus gets up, bleary-eyed, trying to keep his balance as the boat is rocking back and forth. He looks at the wind and the waves and he rebukes it. He says, quiet, be still. You know, if I did that, nothing would happen. Christ says it and the winds die down and the waves stop. And in verse 41 of Mark, it says the the disciples said they were terrified and asked each other, 
Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Who is this? And then R.C. Sproul, talking about this, said, The disciples could find no category adequate to capture the person of Jesus. He was beyond typecasting. He was in a class by himself. Who is this Jesus? In John 8, the Lord Jesus stood before a crowd of Jewish men and women in the court of the women of the temple. It was here that that uh, that older woman came and gave the, the widow's might, if you will. And he says this, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. I am the light of the world, he said. And as he said this, a debate began to ensue about uh, Jesus and who he was. And the Pharisees were asking questions. And then Jesus said, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am, you will indeed die in your sins. And after he said this, the crowd asked, who are you? Can you imagine the incredulous nature of the question? Who are you? Who are you? Who is not of this world? Who gets rid of sins? Who stands against the very logic of our religion? Who makes statements that demand full commitment? Who are you? The Lord Jesus made humanity question its existence, know its existence, and experience the fullness of its existence. What about you? Have you asked this question? Have you settled this question? Who are you, Jesus? In Mark 8, the Lord Jesus asked his disciples while he was in Caesarea Philippi, who do people say that I am? And immediately they put him in categories. He's a prophet. He's John the Baptist. He's Elijah. He was someone we can identify with, someone we can classify, so we know what we're talking about and we know how to respond. Then Jesus looks at his disciples and he asks them, But what about you? Who do you say that I am? Have you asked this question? Have you even attempted to answer the question? Who is Christ? He is the one who explains and defines you. He's the very existence and the fullness and potential of all that you as a human can become. So I challenge you today. Know and celebrate Christ. Know and celebrate Christ. Welcome him into your lives. Usher him into your minds. Welcome him into your homes and into your presence, into your jobs, into your very existence. In Matthew 21 is the story of Jesus entering Jerusalem after having traveled from Galilee. In Matthew 20, verses 17 through 19, let's go there and just read that. Turn the, to the next chapter, Matthew 20, 17. It says, now as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 dis- disciples aside and said to them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will turn him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He will die, but he will also rise. He will suffer, but he will overcome. He will be he will be betrayed. He will suffer. He will struggle with with uh, people flogging him and defeating him, but he will also be praised. Our Lord Jesus Christ will face the very evil that he will destroy. If Christ can face death and overcome it, what can you face and not overcome it? What can you do and not succeed in the will of God? In Matthew 21, Jesus arrives. He's near Jerusalem. He's not quite there. He arrives in the city or town of Bethany where Mary, Martha, and Lazarus live. It's only a couple miles away from Jerusalem. And while there on a Saturday, the Lord Jesus went to Simon's house and they had a supper. Simon was known to have had leprosy. Jesus was anointed by Mary, the sister of Lazarus. She anointed his feet and head with expensive perfume. And Simon was probably healed by Christ and Lazarus was raised from the dead. And so it was a joyous time, a time to celebrate the victories of of Christ in these men's lives, in these families' lives. It was a joyous time before it would turn dark when Jesus was to be crucified. Jesus was preparing for his final and complete confrontation, not with people, not with political leaders, not with ideas and not with religion, but with sin. 
He had his confrontation with sin, death, disease, and hell. He was to reveal himself one more time. What would the response be? What would they say when asked the question, who is this man? I tell you, know and celebrate Christ. Let's take a few statements here. Number one, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Let's look at the first three verses of Matthew 21. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, which means house of figs, by the way, and came to Bethpage, Phage of the Mount of Olives, Olives, got to speak better. Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell them that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. So in verse one, the Lord Jesus is approaching Jerusalem. He can see the city as it's laid out in a panoramic display as he stands on the Mount of Olives. The city is truly to behold a beautiful sight. It's busy. The city is busy. It's active and yet unaware. In Luke 20, when Jesus looks at the city in this story of the triumphal entry that we read uh, or will read through, he weeps over the city. He weeps over it because his heart is broken for the people, the leaders, the lost, the dying and the forgotten. He weeps. He stood on the Mount of Olives in the city of this city called the House of Figs. It's interesting that in Zechariah 14, 4, we read on that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley with half of the mountain moving north and half moving south. Then the Lord, my God, will come and all the holy ones with him. Zechariah 14, 4. The Mount of Olives is a place where Christ will be revealed for who he is completely and finally. And it is here in Matthew when we get a taste of what is to come. Christ is descending the mount, about to enter into the city. In Acts 1, it's interesting that Jesus is on the Mount of Olives when he ascends into heaven. And, they, and they're standing and the disciples are looking up into the sky trying to get a glimpse of Jesus. I think he's over there, you know. And two angels come down and say, this Jesus whom you saw ascend into heaven will come back in the same manner that you saw him leave. On the Mount of Olives, he ascended into heaven. As Jesus stood on the Mount of Olives, he was declaring his kingship. He was proclaiming his messiahship and he was explaining his deity. He is God, Savior, and he is the one to come and who, and who will come again. He is to be heard, he is to be known, and he is truly to be celebrated. So let's make a few observations. Number one, Jesus is Lord in the smallest of things. In the smallest of things. Prior to coming to Jerusalem, Jesus was in Jericho. And from Jericho to Jerusalem is about 17 miles. And you climb the whole way up. <laughs> and it's 3,000 feet. So it's a pretty steep climb. So Jericho is below sea level. And, and Jerusalem is a little bit above it. And this was also known. Jericho was known as a winter capital. For the, for the leaders. So Herod the Great, he had a nice place there in Jericho. And all the wealthy people would go to Jericho when it turned cold because it was nice and warm. Well, while in Jericho, he healed two men who were blind. Already a large crowd was following Jesus into Jerusalem. The two blind men, when they heard that Christ was coming, uh, began to shout to Jesus saying, Son of David, come and help us. And the crowd said, Shh, be quiet. Don't bother him. But they kept calling out louder and louder. Jesus, son of David, come heal us. And so Jesus goes over them, touches their eyes, heals them. And then they join Jesus's entourage. Now, Jesus has approached his city, Bethphage, at the crest of the Mount of Olives. And he sends two of his disciples, two of his disciples to go into the small town and gather a donkey and its colt. The way it's written is interesting in, in the grammar of this of these verses. The way it's interesting, the Lord Jesus has control over the situation. He's ordering the events. He's dictating the journey. The wording for Jesus, literally, if we're to read it, is the Jesus will send, will send his two disciples. And then you have the word immediately used twice. The future tense of the verb implies immediately or it will happen. The use of the words immediately means it will happen 
for sure. There will not be a delay. Be a delay. There will not be a problem. There will not be a, a bureaucratic juggernaut. What Christ wants to happen will happen. The donkey will be found and it's cult. If there is an owner and he complains, just tell them what I told you to say and he'll release the animals. There is not a problem of it not happening. It will happen. Now, similarly, if you were to look a few chapters over to verse 18 of chapter 26, you see the same type of wording. Chapter 26, verse 18 When he told him to go prepare the fat Passover. In verse 18 of chapter 26, he says, he replied, go into the city of a a certain man and tell him the teacher says my appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. Same type of thing. Go and do this. It happens. No problem. Jesus is Lord in even the smallest events. The disciples did as the Lord directed. The Christ life is not a haphazard life. It is not a whimsical life. It is a life directed and ordained to demonstrate the truth and power and the will of God's heart. And you are part of that plan. What we are seeing is the sovereignty of God, even in the tiniest of details. There's a young man named John Marant, a 14-year-old who was living in the colonial times was converted through the preaching of George Whitfield. His family disapproved of his newfound faith or beliefs, and so he left home with his Bible and a, and a hymn book in his pocket. And he wandered through the wilderness several days, eating little, sleeping his, in trees for fear of beasts. And finally he came upon a Cherokee hunter who captured him or found him, and he asked him, how did he live? And John mentioned, he said, well, I'm supported by the Lord. And he asked, how did he sleep? The Lord Jesus provides. He inquired, what has preserved you? The Lord Jesus has done it. You say this, Lord Jesus does this and does that and everything for you. For you. He must be a fine man. Where is he? He, he is here, present. And so they, this Cherokee hunter took him back to his village and the village leaders looked at him and condemned him to death very quickly. And the executioner showed how he was going to die. And explained in detail how he is going to be executed. And as he heard this, John began to burst into prayer. And his words were so moving that the executioner took him to the chief. And opening the little Bible to, that he had to Isaiah 53, he began talking about Jesus. And, how he be, and he began reading saying, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Turning here and there through his Bible, he read scripture passage after scripture passage. Preaching the gospel, converting him among other things, among other people, the chief himself finding Christ. And for the next two years, this young man preaching the gospel, teaching these, these men and women, he lived among these Cherokees, preaching and teaching, making disciples. Know and celebrate Christ. Number two, declare Jesus is Lord. Declare it! As Jesus prepared for his entry into the city by descending the Mount of Olives, he's specific in how he wants to enter the city. He's specific in what he wants his disciples to do. He's specific in what they are to do and what they are to say. He is working it out. He's working it out. His presence among his people, his disciples, and eventually his church is demonstrated by the truth, the reality that he is Lord. We declare that, we affirm that, the the disciples declare that by their obedience. In 21.6 of Matthew, it says very clearly, the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed. They went and did it. The disciples went and did it. When Christ is obeyed, he is declared. When the disciples obeyed, others could cry out and declare his lordship. Our obedience to Christ gives others the option to know Christ and to declare his lordship. It it drives others to their knees when we obey Christ so they can worship the one who is worthy of worship. He is Lord and we're called to declare him. When Jesus told his disciples to go into the village, he told the disciples that if anyone objects, that they're to say the Lord needs them. 
He is referring to himself, saying that he needs the donkey and the colt. He is the Lord. If he is calling himself Lord, should we not call him Lord? Should we not declare it? In Philippians 2, 9 through 11, it says this. Therefore, God exalted him, Christ, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the father. Jesus Christ, you are Lord. Know and celebrate him. Second thing we want to look at in this passage is Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the truth. Let's look at four through seven. This took place. What was spoken through the prophet say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you. Gentle and riding on a donkey on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey, the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. The prophetic declaration affirms that Jesus Christ is Lord. He fulfilled prophecy. Christ is the demonstration and the one who demonstrated by what others had said of him. There are two prophets, two prophetic voices in this passage. One in Zechariah and one in Isaiah. In Zechariah 9.9, we read, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the full of a donkey. In in Isaiah 62, we read, The Lord has made a proclamation to the ends of the earth. Say to the daughters of Zion, See, your Savior comes. See, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. Let's make a couple observations. Number one, Jesus fulfilled prophecy. He fulfilled it. Christ was declared before he arrived. He was written of, anticipated, and hoped for. Christ was implied, hinted, and expected. Christ did not come to fulfill preconceived notions. He did not come to confirm what others hoped he'd be. He did not come to execute a temporary dream, but to honor and obey the will of God so the completion of God's holiness would be known, so that an eternal answer would be heard and known. As early as Genesis 3.15, we hear the prophetic words of Jesus. In Genesis 3, it says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head. You will strike his heel. Notice the singular he. He will. The seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. Christ will crush Satan. In Genesis 12.7, the Lord God said to Abraham, To your offspring seed, I will give this land. It is singular. Jesus Christ is the seed. The nation of Israel, the people of God are embodied in Christ. If you're in Christ, you are God's people. He sees you in him. In Psalm 2, we hear, he said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. The history of Israel, the kings of the past, the promises of God are wrapped up in Christ. The fulfillment and completion of God is Christ. He not only fulfills prophecy, he is the word and the utterance of prophecy. He is the foundation upon which the words are heard. He is the establishment of the truth and the declaration of life. In Ephesians 1, 9 through 10, we read, And he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment. To bring all things in heaven and earth together under one head, even Christ. Christ, as he fulfills prophecy, directs history and converges the future. The ancient words spoken of him, fulfilled by him, believed by those who need him. I tell you, know and celebrate Christ. You know, let me show you the power of prophecy and the truth of it. Imagine you went up to a woman who's in their third month. Uh, a pregnant woman, that is. Makes better sense, right? <laughs> Get there. She's pregnant three months. You go up to her and say, you know, I'm going to make eight predictions about your child. Eight predictions. I'm going to predict the the sex of the child, 
the date of birth, the name, the weight at birth, the college the child will go to, the occupation the child will have, the manner of death the child will die, and the age at which the child will, will die. Now, eight predictions, right? Those eight predictions. You know the chances of you getting all those right? One in 10 to the 17th power. That's one with 17 zeros. Okay. You go to any odds like that, you're going to lose. One in 10 to the 17th power. Let me give an example of what one in 10 to the 17th power is. Cover the state of Texas with silver dollars two feet deep. Take one of those uh, silver dollars and put a red X in there on it. Put it back in there. Take a giant spoon. Mix it up in the state of Texas. Okay. Then blindfold someone. And they can walk wherever they want to walk. But the first coin they have to pick up has to be the one with the red X. That is 1 in 10 to the 17th power. And that is just eight statements, eight predictions. In the Old Testament, there are 300 prophecies of Christ fulfilled. 300 prophecies written centuries before Christ walked the earth. Jesus fulfilled prophecy. Know and celebrate him, my friend. Know and celebrate him. Number two, Jesus is the meaning of prophecy. When we say the Lord Jesus fulfilled prophecy, it means that he defined the reality of God's mind when those prophecies were uttered. How do we interpret God's word? Christ is the ultimate expression of the word. He is the utterance and definition of the word. Before when they heard the words of Isaiah and Zechariah declaring that the king come riding on a donkey. Who was that? Who were they thinking of? How is that to be understood? It is understood in Christ. He is the past, the present, and future of revelation. How can you know the truth until it's revealed to us by God? The passage that Lon read to us earlier, Psalm 24 says, Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. In Matthew 21, we hear these words. See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey. He is gentle. He is meek. What we see is the direct expression and meaning of power is described and defined in meekness. God's power of strength is meekness. Not the brute strength or raw, uncontained power. Christ is not a brute beast uncontrolled by his emotional thinking or even thinking. In fact, it is the the limitation of Christ that expressed God's ultimate power. When we think of power, we always think opposite of who Christ is. And when we think of power, Christ defined power, true power, when he died and rose again. When we see the word power, we must see Christ. It's it's sort of like in Revelation chapter 5, when John has a vision of heaven and God is, is sitting on the throne. He's holding this scroll. And he says, who can open the scroll? Who can open the seven seals? And no one was found worthy to open the seven seals. And so John begins to weep and he's crying. And the angel says, stop weeping. Stop weeping. And he says, uh, do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He's able to open the scroll and it's seven seals. So he says, stop. The lamb, uh, the lion, the tribe of Judah, he's going to open it. And then he turns and he sees, and you know what he sees? He sees a lamb. He hears lion and he sees lamb. Now, you know, normally we'd be disappointed, right? He heard the word lion, saw lamb. He heard power, he saw meekness. There is not power or uh, there is no power when there is not meekness. Meekness, it is the power demonstrated through meekness. It is power demonstrated through the weakness of Christ in his death and resurrection. Christ defined power by revealing the truth. So know and celebrate him. Number three, Jesus is worthy. So he said, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is truth. And Jesus is worthy. Let's look at the last set of verses. Starting with verse eight. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. 
When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. That's all they could come up with, a prophet. So the disciples had done what Christ had asked. They went into the village of Bethphage and found the colt and the donkey tied up. In Luke and, and uh, the book of Luke, Jesus wanted the colt, which had never been ridden, for sure. Also in Luke and Mark, when they actually, the disciples went to get the, the donkey and the colt, uh, the owners complained, hey, what are you doing? And of course, they answered, as Jesus had instructed, the Lord has need of it, and they released the animals. Now, it's interesting that in Ma- Matthew, we're only told that we have a donkey and a colt. The others don't mention the donkey and the colt. The colt was probably with its mother, obviously, meaning that it needed to be with its mother. Well, when talking about the colt, which had never been ridden, D.A. Carson said this, In the midst, then, of this excited crowd, an unbroken animal remains calm under the hands of the Messiah who controls nature. Another statement, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is truth, and Jesus is worthy. Let's make some observations. Jesus Christ is king, the meek king. Jesus rode the colt down the Mount of Olives into the entrance of the city. And as he's riding, people were spreading out palm branches and praising him. The words used were declarations that he is the Messiah and Lord. He is the king. The people shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna in the highest. This is directly taken from Psalm 118. Where we read, O Lord, save us. O Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we, uh, we bless you. When the word Hosanna was heard, Savior was meant. When the word Hosanna was said, King was the definition. The people had learned to look to the King to bring them salvation. Now the King, the true King, was coming. He was entering his holy city. The prophets talked about Christ coming to the temple. In Psalm 24, again, what was read to us earlier, they expected the Lord to arrive. In Malachi 3, 1, we read, read, Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The Lord Jesus is king. In Revelation 17, it says, He is the Lord of lords and king of kings. The true nature of Christ was demonstrated as he rode that donkey into town, as people praised him. Christ is worthy to be praised. He's worthy to be known. Stand before your king and celebrate him. Let worship be a daily expression of your love toward him. Let your words, your actions, and your relationship, all your relationships, exalt Christ to the fullest. The king who is riding is still king. And he is still worthy. Secondly, Jesus Christ is peace. He is peace. You know, a ship was wrecked in a furious storm. And the only survivor was a little boy who was swept by the waves onto a rock. He sat there all night long until the next morning he was spotted and rescued. Did you tremble while you were on the rock during the night? Someone later asked him. Yes, said the boy. I trembled all night, but the rock didn't. You know, the Christ who rode down the Mount of Olives into the city of Jerusalem, as he was being praised, rode on this colt. He was not riding in to declare war, but peace. His statement of the animal was saying that he has secured peace. The battle, the victory, was already already won in Christ. He had already won it, even before he took on the battle. Christ has come and offers peace. He is the rock that does not tremble. He is the one who stands before evil and evil melts away. In John 14, 27, Jesus said these words, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. This is a man who's about to face death who will die. And he's saying, I give you peace. In Philippians 4, Jesus said, uh, uh, Paul wrote this. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus, who reigns, who is Lord, gives you peace. He came in peace and in, and, in, and he gives you peace. He desires you to live in peace. He has secured peace even before the battle begun. He has said, I give you peace. Regardless of what he is about to face, Christ will bring peace. 
He came on a donkey, not on a horse. He wasn't going to lead an army to destroy the Roman Empire. His fight was not with them, but with the sin that motivated them. As the people followed and watched, they waved their palm branches, as the kids had done earlier today with us. It's interesting if you read Revelation 7. It says this, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they worshipped. In this passage in Matthew, we get a glimpse of heaven. Worship happening, peace established. Christ is the rock that does not tremble. He is the Lord who reigns. I tell you, know and celebrate him. Have you settled that question? Have you asked that question? Who is Christ? I hope you have. Because he is truly worthy. He is truth. And he is Lord. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the salvation that we have in Christ. I thank you for the joy that we have because of Christ. And I ask you now, Lord, that you would fill us with your presence and, your no- and the knowledge of who you are. And that we would live faithfully to you, for you. We will not deny you, but declare you. Lord, thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus. Thank you for sending him to us. And may we worship him daily. In Jesus' name.